This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. The first Objection History Seminar of 2016. Mm-hmm. And I'm delighted to welcome Sarah Flew, who, as you can see, has been a short time in the study of philanthropy, the charitable account books of Lord Overston. 1844, <laughs> so this source I discovered when I was doing my PhD, um, Lord Overstone was one of the principal funders of the Church of England in the 19th century in London. Yes. Yeah. yes. So this is Lord Overstone in 1880, it's from a painting at the Roman Reading University. Um, not that he had anything to do with Reading University, but his daughter, um, Lady Wantage, was one of the founders. So his, um, Lord Overstone's library was their founding collection. So um, Lord Overstone's daughter, although she didn't write a biography about her father, she wrote one about her husband. And in her husband's biography, she describes her father. Um, he looked at everything in the white light of reason, yet preserved withal a warmth of heart and generosity of disposition that showed itself in constant deeds of kind thoughtfulness and large benevolence. His many acts of generosity towards people of every class, high and low, were done with a delicacy and consideration for the feeling of the recipients that made it almost as blessed to receive as to give. Born to wealth and endowed with a genius for business which caused that wealth to increase and multiply, he fully recognised the heavy responsibility that attaches itself to great possessions, whether in money or in land. Display and luxury had small attraction for him, yet the duties of his position as a rich man and as a large landowner he discharged to the full. So people who have written about um, Lord Overstone are generally economic historians who are interested in, in him as a businessman um, and his role in the banking system. They um, almost exclusively focus on these, uh, these aspects of him. However, Overstone the philanthropist, in contrast to Overstone the banker, is worthy of study in its own right. So the papers that I discovered during my PhD are here in Senate House, um, where the Lloyd collection is deposited in the manus- his set of manuscript letters. Um, within this collection are four manuscript ledger books, um, two are solely on his philanthropy and two are on his sort of income and expenditure. Um, somebody has looked at them, an income historian has looked at them, from, but from the perspective of sort of his investment income. So nobody's done any work on his philanthropy. Um, what I found interesting about him when I did my PhD, because I was doing it on the financing of the Church of England, is this is one of his account books and the fly leaves of them are entirely inscribed with quotes on how he should um, how he should act as a rich man. Many of them are quite religious, but some of them are more about duty and responsibility. So you can see there are a couple of biblical ones, Matthew, um, Psalm um, 62. It's quite interesting, the second quote is from Newman, Cardinal Newman. Um, that doesn't really dovetail with how people regard Lord Overstone, but I'll get onto that in a minute. Um, interestingly, though, you can see he's a very well-educated man. This quote here is from Francis Bacon. This one here, which I quite like, is William Bates, who's chaplain to King Charles II. If one has a cabinet full of pearls and has not a heart to make use of them, it is all one as if it was full of cherry stones, for there is no true value in the possession but in order to the true and noble use of them. This is essentially the theme of all his um, quotes, which there are probably about 20 of in total. So uh, such quotations underline the centrality of his Christian faith to his attitudes to the stewardship of money and its dispersal through philanthropic action. 
And a part of this, widely promoted in the mid late 19th century, which I've written about, was the practice of systematic or pro proportional giving as advocated by societies such as the Systematic Beneficent Society, the Proportional Giving Union, and the Society of God. Um, these were evangelical societies that were encouraging people to systematically tithe 10% of their income. Um, the Systematic Beneficent Society was created in response to the um, Irish potato famine, where they found that getting people to tithe 10% of their income in a systematic way increased giving levels. Um, this concept of giving in a charitable account book, I have come across in other biographies, not that I've ever come across one that actually has survived. So, um, one, another banker I've written about, Richard Foster, kept a charitable account book, and as did um, William Gladstone. Um, Gladstone found that the act of systematically setting aside at least a tenth of his income at the start of the year, and then recording it in a notebook, he would therefore ensure that he gave away the right proportion of his income. It also, and I don't know if he says this, means that you can then stop giving money away when you've reached the limit. But <laughs> you can then turn people around, away, going, well, you know, I've done my charitable duty for this year. So Lord Overstone's charitable account books act as a barometer of the major social and welfare issues of the time, both domestically and internationally. And a really, I find really interesting from that angle because you can see how Overstone is recognisable as a philanthropist today and in a way the philanthropic landscape in a way is recognisable as it is today. But it also sheds light on his private side um, of this man who's best known for his banking genius. So this is another photo of Lord Overstone, which I really like, taken by Julia Margaret Cameron, who's quite a famous 19th century photographer who also crops up in his donation book, which is quite interesting and I'll cover later on. So I'm going to give you a biography now of um, Overstone, how he's generally described um, in his sort of banking and political sphere. So Samuel Jones Lloyd was undoubtedly one of the most influential bankers of the 19th century, was born in 90, um, 1796 in the city of London in the shadow of the Bank of England just behind it in Loughborough. Unexpectedly for a man of such great financial standing, his family background is relatively modest. The Lloyd family was from Carmarthenshire in Wales, and his father, rather unexpectedly, was a Unitarian clergyman, so the Reverend Lewis Lloyd. Now Lewis, upon failing to secure a position he wanted in Wales, applied in 1789 for the role of assistant classical tutor at the Manchester Academy with the um, additional role of supply preacher at the Dobbs Lane Chapel in Failsworth, Manchester. And it's here that he met his wife, Sarah Jones, and it's him meeting Sarah that caused him to give up his Unitarian ministry and become a banker. Because <laughs> Sarah's family were a big banking family in Manchester. And so Lewis and Sarah get married in 1793 and Overstone is born three years later and he's the only child of this marriage. Lewis Lloyd proved to be a truly talented banker and together with his wife's brothers, Samuel and William Jones, founded the banking firm of Jones, Lloyd and Company. So this is why Samuel has the hyphenated surname of Jones and Lloyd. Under, Lloyd's, under Lewis Lloyd's direction, the small banking firm was transformed from a modest provincial bank to one of the country's leading banks with the establishment of an additional branch office in London, at 43 Loftbury, where Lord Overstone was born. So by the um, age of 91, when Lewis Lloyd dies, he's, his fortune is 701,000 in securities um, and investment in land at 1.2 million. So he's got about nearly nine million pounds he's amassed. Um, and he often joked, apparently, that not getting the ministry position he wanted in Wales was one of the great fortunes of his life. Um, so during his retirement, Lewis Lloyd buys Overstone Park um, near Northampton, where Lord Overstone eventually takes his name from when he takes his peerage, which was a 15,000 acre estate, and he also buys the Manor of Lockinge in Berkshire. 
the names of um, Northampton and Berkshire feature really strongly in the donation book. So Samuel Jones Lloyd consequently was brought up in an increasingly wealthy household. His birth is registered with the Unitarians at Dr. Williams Library, but he was brought up as a member of the Church of England, and this is quite usual. Um, when somebody becomes wealthy, they assimilate into the Church of England. You see that a lot in the 19th century. His education, he went to Eton, then he was privately tutored by the High Church Bishop of London, and Charles James Bloomfield, then he went on to Trinity College at Cambridge, graduating in 1818. Um, he was made a partner in the family firm in 1816, but did not initially have much involvement in the firm, choosing instead to serve as the Liberal Member of Parliament for Hythe in Kent between 1819 and 1826. Um, he's then defeated in his attempt to serve as a Minister of for Manchester, for member for Manchester in 1832. This is the last time he stands for Parliament. In 1829, he marries Harriet Wright, um, who's a daughter of a Nottingham banker. And you see Nottingham appear to a small degree in the charitable account book. But, and again, they only have one surviving child. So the family nucleus is quite small. This is Harriet Sarah, who marries Major Robert James Lindsay and takes Lindsay is forced to take the name Lloyd Lindsay um, and they marry in 1858 at St Martin's in the Field Church which is very prominent in the donation book. Um, they later on became become Lord and Lady Wantage. Um, Overstone settles his Lockinge estate in Berkshire upon the couple um, Lockinge being two miles from Wantage. So, um, if we go on to sort of, uh, there's not, in his biography, you don't actually see him necessarily doing that much at the bank, but he does a lot of work um, through government in the bank to do with the banking system. He's quite influential. Um, so from the 1830s and subsequent to his political positions, he increasingly, um, took public positions um, to do with par parliamentary commissions and select committee, um, committees and he also authors um, many quite influential pamphlets on banking and financial issues. So examples of select committees and other appointments he takes is um, in 1831 he's um, an exchequer bill commissioner he appears for, before the Select Committee on the Renewal of the Charge of the Bank of England in 1832. He's appointed to the Commission on Handling Weavers, um, 1837 to 40. He appears put before the Select Committee on Postage in 1838. Um, he appears before the Select Committee on the Bank, Banks of Issue in 1841, and he's um, regarded to be very influential in the content of the Bank Charter Act of 1844. The, for the, from pretty much the period though of his account book, you see him having less involvement in business and less involvement in politics and more involved in sort of philanthropy. He does appear as a named person on a lot of committee lists, but then quite often they would do that in the 19th century anyway if you gave enough money. Vice president quite often only means that you were giving £100 a year rather than being any sort of executive committee role. Um, one of the really important roles he took was um, from, the, uh, from 8 January 1847, he's on the British Association for the Release, Relief of the Extremes Distress in Ireland and Scotland, so the British response to the Irish potato famine that he was the chairman in charge of Irish Relief. So you see, um, this does appear in his donation book in that you see a number of sort of thousand pound donations made towards this cause. So in 1849, he's offered a peerage, and 1850 takes his place in the House of Lords, assuming the new title of Baron Overstone. When he takes the peerage, he sees his all direct involvement in the family banking firm and in the early 1860s, both branches, the London and Manchester branches, are taken over by other larger banks when his um, brother-in-laws both retire. 
So after 1850, he dedicates his service to numerous public and philanthropic roles and the management of his estate. Um, he continues to sit on a few select committees, but they quite often relate to those now relating to his personal interests. For example, in 1850, he becomes a trustee of the National Gallery. He's also a commissioner of the Great Exhibition of 1851, and is the leader um, in the Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition of 1857. Um, he does take a critical role in the commission on decimal coinage. I didn't realise in the 19th century they tried to introduce de decimal coinage, but he's very against it and they managed to stop it going through by making it a really slow, painful process that eventually everybody gives up on the idea. Um, throughout most of his adult life, he acted in some capacity at the University of London. So he's a council member between 1828 and 44. He's a Senate member from 1850 to 1877. Then, rather disappointingly, he resigns in opposition to the proposal that degrees may be conferred on women. <laughs> um, he's really concerned with the volunteer movement and the defence of the realm, particularly in respect of the dangers from France. This features um, a lot in his donation book. He's, um, he's a member of the Volunteer Commission, gives quite a lot of money um, to rifle corps. Um, and then he, he's also a member of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. He held, held roles in numerous charities, um, to which his presidency of the Charing Cross Hospital between 1868 and 1880 was central. So at his death, in 1883, aged 87, <coughs> so his charitable account book covers his life from age sort of 47 to 87. Um, at his death, his securities are valued at 2.1 million and his property at 3.1 million. So he's undoubtedly one of the wealthiest men in the 19th century. Um, W.D. Rubenstein, whose book Men of Property I'm very fond of, um, states that Overstone was one of the greatest new landowners of the 19th century and that he owned about 31,000 acres of land at his death, which he'd spent 1.7 million purchasing. Um, so he, this is a man with a lot of disposable income. If you look at his, not the ledgers I look at, but the other two ledgers, quite often his income was 100,000 a year. Um, so the charitable account books um, cover the period December 1843, he starts just after Christmas, and they end in September 1883, just um, seven weeks before he dies. Um, because I really like data, I've been put it all into an Excel spreadsheet, so I can tell you that it covers 2,879 payments amounting to £365,000. Um, it includes payments to around 290 charities. I haven't honed that down yet because obviously charity names, he doesn't always write the correct version of the charity name and they change slightly, especially with the hospital names. I would have to track them through quite carefully. But roughly, um, the major, to, if you were dividing the 290 charities up, the major players are there are about 90 health societies, about 45 religious societies, and 109 welfare societies. So, let me see if I can read this then. A man explained his handwriting. So, Widow of gamekeeper at Wolvey, Wolvey's in Warwickshire. Um, Overstone school expenses, so this is a school in the village that he builds. Poor woman per Mr. Holloway. Um, Little Brighton Sanitarium per Lady Ma Mary Fielding. Reverend Edward Lawford. Um, Mr. Britain, late wine merchant. Um, Polish officer per Dr. Sandwith. Um, female artist institution, Purvis is great, um, Charing Cross Hospital, um, Crosby Hall classes, no idea where Crosby Hall is, um, Lancastrian schools in Manchester, the Coeur de Leon statue, which I'll mention later on, chest disease infirmary per G. Baring, 
North West London Reformatory per Mr Humphrey. Um, Humphrey is the vicar of um, St Martin's in the Field. Um, House of Refuge for Penitents per Mrs William Gladstone. So that's like a typical page. I'm going to give you another one. Um, so Metropolitan Convalescent Institution, Diocesan Education Fund, that will be the London Board of Education, which is used to as well. Church at Naples, which, given how strange and unusual his religious beliefs could frankly be for any denomination. Um, City of London College, St Sepulchre's Church in Northampton, Presence to Cottages at Lockinge, um, which is a wantage in Oxfordshire. Female Penitentiary, um, the Musgrave Memorial in Hereford. Um, this is the Archbishop of um, York who died the year before. Fothering Gay School and Clothing Club, Club which is in North Hans. Um, Shakespeare Garden Purchase. Um, Welling Borough Church Restoration, which is in North Hans. Moulton Baptist Chapel, which is in North Hans. Bedfordbury Chapel, which seems to be a chapel of ease for St Martins in the field. And Mr Mortlock Barton, Mr Woodhouse <coughs> Relation. So, I mean, that's, they're just some examples of um, what the notebook looks like. Um, so the first question I was interested in, which isn't a typically interesting question, um, but it's because I'm interested in the account I was interested in this. I did a monthly distribution of how the payments fell, um, just because it was something I was curious about. So you can see most fall in De December and January are really high months, and then again May and June, and that makes perfect sense to me. Um, quite a lot of charities have their um, do their budget years th January through to December, so it makes sense that you're making the payment at the beginning or the end of the year. Quite often, if a charity is doing badly, I've seen distressing appeals in December for money because they're not going to balance the books. So quite often, charities get a lot of money in December. Obviously, Christmas is a factor as well. And then the May June thing. Incidents make sense as well because of the May season, so that's when charities have their AGM. So it makes sense that you're more likely to give in May when you go to the AGM or immediately afterwards. Um, so there's another sort of question I was interested in. So I've, I've grouped all payments into amount categories and then I put them in year groups because I just wanted to see how it's philanthropy change through the period and you can see the big jump is here that virtually the numbers double here which is interesting to me because his father dies in 1858 so that's when he comes into most of his money so i expected to see that in this period here but you can see that there is a big leap in terms of the number of payments and uh, general size as he gets older um, i have tried to categorise the payments, this I think I need this needs a bit more work on. But I was just interested to get a quick snapshot of which sectors he was giving the most payments to. So you can see that education's really strong, but then education he never he doesn't really give anything above a thousand pounds. Education's really strong. Religion, Church of England's really strong. Um, but the category he tends to give really big amounts to are uh, to individuals. Um, one of the things that I find quite interesting about him is what he categorises as, as a donation, because they're not necessarily always. Well, he must view them as all being donations, but I wouldn't necessarily think of them as being donations. So a payment he would never put a payment to his daughter in the notebook, or a payment to his son-in-law but practically anybody else, he views it as being a donation. Um, and his, his family, as I've said, is quite tiny. He's an only child and he, has only, he only has one daughter. So if he was going to give a handout to a cousin or an uncle or a niece, he would log it in his donation book. Um, so 
it's in his donations to religious causes that he's generally quite perplexing and I didn't think people like this were supposed to exist in the mid-19th century. Um, he's generally regarded as being evangelical. Boyd Hilton expressly calls him an evangelical, even saying that although Overstone wouldn't have called himself an evangelical, he certainly was one. Um, and I can understand why somebody would label him as evangelical, given that he comes from a Unitarian background. But you don't expect evangelicals to be giving money to Dominican convents in Ireland. Um, but you would expect an evangelical to be giving money to, alongside the Church of England, to say the Wesleyans and the Baptists. Um, he, he doesn't make many donations outside of the Church of England. He gives no money at all to the Unitarians. So when you look at his, um, his giving to the Church of England, that it's generally unfathomable if you think he's supposed to be evangelical, because he generally gives his money to high church societies, which is not how you expect an evangelical to behave. Um, so generally, um, for religious societies, you have an evangelical and a high church version of everything. So he, he gives the additional curate society, it's really obvious what that money is spent on, so he gives lots of money to the high church version of the society and then hardly any money to the evangelical version of the society. Yet he gives a, quite a lot of money to the Evangelical Scripture Readers Association. <laughs> um, so that's really strange. And likewise with his um, treatment of, sort of foreign missionary societies, he gives lots of money to the SPG, no money at all to the CMS. Um, and likewise, he gives lots of money to the, the SPCK, which he calls the Christian Knowledge Society, and only a tiny bit of money to the British Foreign Bible Society. Um, now, he goes mainly to St. Martin's in the Fields Church, which is a high church church, and its vicar, Reverend Humphreys, is the treasurer of the SPCK. So, I find his behaviour very confusing. That was one of the things that I noticed when I first came across his charitable account book, is that he doesn't behave in the way you would expect him to. Um, his, the majority of his funding to religious societies goes to the Bishop of London's fund, which has a mixed church party constitution. So you can see he gives 11,600 to the Bishop of London's fund. He gives. Um, which is like a central war chest of money for um, diocesan organisations to get grants from. And he also gives 3,000 to two other bishops of London for diocesan purposes. He also gives a bit of money to the predecessor of the Bishop of London's fund. And to give context to that amount, 15,000 would build you through, um, buy the site for three churches and you'd be able to build them as well. So it's a significant amount of money. He also spends 5,000 on the church in his village. Um, he buys the locking the Bowson, um, which gives you the right to be able to appoint the vicar for the church. Um, he spends an extortionate amount of money on the parsonage in New Saints um, in Northampton. He also, a lot of his money goes out to small churches, so grants um, of like 50 pounds here and there, particularly to localities he has connections but he, he gives money to the St Paul's Cathedral Restoration Fund. Um, he also gives quite a lot of money to church schools. So it's like his core um, cause, I would say. Um, the other organisations um, more straightforward and recognisable. These are like accumulated donations. So Charing Cross Hospital, he was um, president of and in he generally gives £50 in his early phase, £100 a year in the later phase. Uh, Devonshire Hospital is Duke of Devonshire, not in the county of Devon. Um, I don't know why he gives so much money to that. I haven't found any you know, connection yet. Manchester Infirmary, his connection with Manchester is through his banking firm, where they have branches in Manchester. Other than London, the three localities that feature most of all in his um, philanthropy are London, Northampton and Manchester. Um, 
Margate Sea Bathing Infirmary also does quite well out of him. I don't know what his connection with the Margate <coughs> is. Um, he was MP for Hyde in Kent. Um, but then you see one-off donations like a thousand pounds to Royal College of Nurses. See the, you know, there are virtually every um, health charity you could think of in London he must give money to. Um, if I go on and give some examples now, so. Um, to give you a financial context, he gives out of his sort of three hundred and fifty thousand he gives away, about seventy-five thousand is to religion. This is the way I've categorised it at the moment, it will change slightly once I've done it properly. Um, about eleven thousand to health, welfare is about fifteen thousand. Again, really sort of recognisable causes. These are just some examples. Um, the artist benevolence fund is what that was for, that was established in 1810. Um, the baths and wash houses, um, this cause was really popular from the mid 19th century um, with rapidly expanding populations and cities and many cholera outbreaks in the 30s and 50s. Um, I think even St. Martin's in the Field has its own bath and wash house. Um, charity Organisation Society, of course, everybody's heard of founded by Helen Bosenkay and Octavia Hill in 1869. Um, the Gentlewomen Home in Harley Street is quite interesting. Um, in 1853, Florence Nightingale was its superintendent and eventually becomes the Florence Nightingale Home for Invalid Gentlewomen. Um, the Indigent Blind Visiting Society is one that I think I should recategorize more as a religious society quite often religious societies sort of masquerade as welfare societies you know they're doing good in the community but their their ultimate aim is to get people to church so the um the, this blind visiting society for example is is evangelical it's founded by shaftesbury and lord Everine, who's um, the duke of westminster as uncle and its aim is to visit and aid the blind poor in their own homes, but to provide them also with religious instruction and Bibles and conduct them to church services. Um, the Metropolitan Association for Improving the Dwellings of Labouring Classes, and you'd have thought they'd have an acronym for that, wouldn't you? Um, aim to provide affordable housing for the working classes on a privately run basis with a financial return for investors. You also see recognisable societies like the Lifeboat Institution, um, which was founded in 1828. Um, Society for Protection of Young Females is founded in 1853 to protect women and children against prostitution. And then this, this is just another sort of example of things that I could categorise as welfare. Again, it's Reverend Humphrey of St Martin's in the Field, and it's the donation for parochial distress. And can't decide whether to categorise that as um, religious donation or welfare donation. Um, if we look now at education, see there are lots and lots of amounts going to specific schools, um, particularly in the villages that Overstone is connected to. Um, so City of London, yeah, City and Scientific Institution, which seems to be the City of London University, I think. Um, Fothering Gay is in North Hants. Um, Wantage, again, is the grammar school in his village. The Wigan Coal and Iron Company School is quite interesting. It's the Wigan Coal and Iron Company Colliery at their own school. Wigan comes up two or three times, two or three times, I think. I think he gives money to Wigan Cricket Club as well. Um, National Society, London Diocese and Board of Education, British and Foreign School Society. Um, one of the sections I've enjoyed the most is donations to disasters. Um, so this is the Turkish Distress Relief Fund is the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78. The Egyptian Relief Fund is the Anglo-Egyptian War that occurs in 1882 between Egypt and Sudan and lots of Egyptians flee Alexandria, which is very heavy by battle. Um, the Cotton Districts Relief Fund, um, so 1861 to 65 was the Lancashire Cotton Famine, 
Um, this was a depression in the textile industry in the northwest of England, brought about by overproduction in a time of contracting world markets. Um, you know, there's a hurricane, um, which was in the Danish West Indies. Um, the Clerkenwell explosion is quite interesting. So this is also known as the Clerkenwell outrage, and it was a bombing in London carried out by the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Um, they exploded a bomb in an attempt to free one of their members from Clerkenwell Prison. And the explosion damages nearby houses, killing 12 people and causing 120 injuries, but none of the prisoners escaped. Um, you see sh quite a few shipwrecks crop up in his account book. So this is the Dalhousie wreck, which wrecks off Beachy Head with a loss of 50 lives and only one survivor. Um, the Abercorn colliery accident. So this was an explosion in the Prince of Wales colliery in the Welsh village of Abercorn on the 11th of September 1878, killing 268 men and boys. Um, and they think the cause of the explosion was the ignition of fire damp by a safety lamp. Um, English refugees from France. So this is the February Revolution of 1848. Um, it was driven by nationalist and republican ideals amongst the French general public who believed that people should rule themselves and it ended the constitutional monarchy of Louis Philippe and created the Second French Republic and many English people came back to London. And then this is uh, an example of a more sort of domestic disaster was there was a, a fire in the village of Long Whittingham in Berkshire and it lost um, a lot of its timber buildings. And I think it's, it's this, this, um, these sort of donations combined with these overall strategic donations causes close to his heart to me makes him very recognisable as a philanthropist that you have these different layers and pockets of, um, that you like to give money to. Um, arts and culture he doesn't actually give as much money to as, as you would expect him to, given that he's on the trustee of the National Gallery, so heavily involved in the um, Great Exhibition. Um, so the Coeur de Lyon statue is um, of Richard the Lionheart, and it's outside the Houses of Parliament. Apparently the statue was made for the Great Exhibition in clay, and then afterwards they all liked it so much they wanted it um, made in bronze. Um, the Ar Architectural Museum, I've not been able to find out where there is yet. Um, the Warwick Castle Restoration. Um, the Hall of Arts and Sciences is the Royal Art Hall. <coughs> uh, he gives some money to the Great Exhibition, um, which he offered to underwrite if it made a loss. Um, the De Morgan Library, this is the Senate House Library page on it. Um, so it's a library that's a collection that spans the 15th to the 19th century, a lot of arithmetic calculus, and um, Overstone buys the library and then gives it to the university. He also pays for it to be completely rebound. Um, the, uh, the area of his philanthropy I need to do the most work on because I don't know who all the individuals are. I'm trying to categorise them as sort of family members, friends, staff. He gives quite a lot of money to clergymen. Um, these are sort of typical examples. He, he quite likes to buy people wine. You see that crop up? Particularly one lady, he's always buying her wine and sending it to her. Um, but there are things like Miss Collins for tour abroad. He quite often seems to outfit people if they want to do the grand tour. There, there, are, there are quite often um, funeral expenses or he helps people with their education. He has some sort of connection with the Athenaeum Club that he often helps people to get in and pays. Um, Lady Main, um, her husband had died the year before, so I don't know whether she couldn't pay the rent anymore, but he offers to just clear the account for her. Um, he gives, uh, so of, of what he calls donations, about 185,000 of that is to people, but um, 
he's very he's very good with his staff, and if, it, if a member of staff gets married or retires or has an injury, he's he's very quick to give them a little handout, and sometimes it'll be on an annual basis until they die. Um, he gives about twenty three thousand of to it just amounts to clergymen. So whether that I'm assuming that was for some sort of religious purpose. Um, I would say half of the money goes to family. And he talks about that in a quote that I'll talk about later. He also gives quite a lot of money to friends, of which the Cameron family um, do quite well out of him. Um, Julia Margaret has, there are two exhibitions about her at the moment, one at the B&A and one at the Science Museum. Um, it's like she's been re rediscovered as a great 19th century photographer. Um, so he gives the Cameron family £6,250 between 1854 and 1883, which is quite a significant amount of money. Um, Lord Overstone went to, to eat with Charles Hay Cameron. Um, there's a definite sense, if you read Julia Margaret Cameron's biographies, that the family constantly lived beyond their means. Um, one biographer is quick to blame Julia Margaret Cameron for not being very thrifty and spending lots of money on her silly um, hobby of photography. Um, she writes a letter to Overstone in 1859 um, calling him an eaten friend who relieves every distress and makes every rough place smooth by his love and loving kindness of bounty. Um, he, you know, he's off, he often gives them quite sizable amounts, a thousand pounds, more than a thousand pounds. When their um, plantation salon becomes bankrupt, he helps them out. Um, he also helps out the Norman family quite a lot, which again is a, a, a associate of his from Eaton. Um, so I absolutely no idea how long I've spoken to, but I'm concluding now. <laughs> um, so this has been a quick dash through Overstone's 40 years of philanthropic action. He made 2,879 payments between December 43 and September 83. They're quite expansive in their scale, theme and geography, um, and in terms of philanthropic motive, Overstone's strong attitude to stewardship of money and how a rich man can should conduct himself and nicely summarised in this quote from him, um, which is just one manuscript sheet. So upon making up my accounts for the year 1874, I am arrested by the magnitude of the fortune which I appear to have accumulated. My first feeling is a moral fear that I have permitted myself to be overcome by a mean and unworthy love of mere wealth, valuing it not for its proper use, but solely for the sordid pleasure of contemplating its constant increase. Riches are at all time a dangerous snare, and wealth is a very solemn trust which is no easy task to administer wisely. As I have found my income increasing, I have in a corresponding degree enlarged my field of liberality. To the branch of our family which was otherwise unprovided for, so presumably this is like his cousins, his aunts, his uncles. I have freely extended all the assistance which it has appeared to me could be judiciously applied, and I still continue to do so. To more distant connections and to various friends I have not been sparing in my donations on proper occasions, whilst to public charities and to private cases of distress, I have given not blindly, but as I trust, with discrimination and judicious liberality. Thank you very much.